it's time for us to check back in with Louisa in Mountain Path and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. It was late October and the mornings were cold. The corn was shocked now, or standing like top-heavy skeletons stripped of its blades and holding its ears for future gathering. The yard was a blanket of little green and yellow apple leaves, and on the hill road, beech and maple leaves made a pleasant rustling as one walked to school. Teacher's desk was always covered with wild grapes and hickory nuts, and the children talked importantly of fodder pulling and cane stripping. For a week, the weather held. Still days of blue, clean air filled with the slow drift of red and yellow leaves. Each morning was a little colder than the previous morning until on a Thursday there was a frost so that Rye and Pete must go into the chilly dawn and cut the sweet potato vines before the sun might touch them and send the frost into the red sweetness of their plump roots. It was because of the sweet potatoes that Louisa said she would go on to school alone and the teacher and the children might follow her when their work was done. She was cold, her teeth chattering in her head. She was tired, too, of what she did not know. Tired of being afraid and thinking of trouble and of not knowing the time, she thought. She looked at her watch. It said 20 minutes of 8, but it might just as easily be 20 minutes of 7 or of 9. Nothing stirred in the early morning fog and blue shadows, and for a moment it seemed that she had stumbled into a dead world that was forever twilight and a long stillness. She reached the schoolhouse and opened the door into its chilly silence, smelling of chalk and apples and dried goldenrod. She shivered and felt colder than walking outside. She must build a fire, she decided. There, there had been but few mornings when a fire was necessary, and then one of the pupils had built it. She looked at the stove dubiously, opened the door, jiggled a hand of a thing protruding from beneath it, and was rewarded with a blast of soot and ashes in her face. She coughed, slammed the door quickly, and determined to build the fire without taking out the ashes. In the back of the room was a bundle of fat pine. Lander and Mabel had gathered at odd times while coming to school. She selected some splinters that looked as if they would easily burn and some larger, heavier wood to put on top. She put the splinters and wood into the stove, receiving another gust of ashes and a badly smutted hand as she did so. Then, with a good deal of hope and not a little doubt, she applied a match to the splinters. The sixth match did the trick, but the triumph of producing a flame was short-lived. The stove smoked. She had never seen it act in that manner and could not understand the cause of such behavior. She opened the door to investigate and a volume of pine smoke well nigh choked her. Coughing and sputtering, she neglected to close the door while she wiped her eyes and when she turned again to look at the fire, she saw that it was out. The splinters were all burned away and in order to get in more wood, she would first have to take out all the larger wood she had placed on top. Her temper had not been of the best when she entered the schoolhouse. Now it was worse. She was further irked when she noticed the damper. It was turned flat, just as it was turned yesterday when the day grew warm and a fire was no longer needed. And at the university, she had been considered one of the young intellectuals. It was disgusting. She had failed to do in a half an hour what the dumbest of her pupils could finish in three minutes. Such were her thoughts as she jerked the sticks of wood from the stove. She noticed as she took out a stick none too gently, the stove shook a little. Well, let it shake. She reached for the next stick, larger and farther down. She felt an especially vicious surge of hatred for the placidly thick stick of pine and stubbornly cold, tall stove and for the clumsy fire builder that was herself. She caught the stick in the middle. Instead of taking care to draw it out by its end, it stuck. She gave it a hearty shake and noticed without a great deal of concern that the stove was shaking again. Past Karen, she gave the stick another pull and shake longer and harder than any of the others. Too late, she realized what she had done. She could only step aside and watch the stove fall with a mighty banging and clattering. There was a long moment of waiting to see what parts were broken and another one of relief on seeing that the stove's three bellies and top, 
though widely separated on the floor, were yet whole. She saw, too, through a thick cloud of smoke and dust that the Hayes and Lee Buck cows, the only two families sending during molasses-making time, had come, and now stood in the door and looked upon the wreck of the schoolhouse heat heating plant in pleased silence. It's a good thing it didn't fall on ye, teacher, Rye said. Yes, Louisa could agree, but half-heartedly, for the moment she almost wished she were under the stove. I, I guess we'll have to have school outside in the sunshine for a while, she told them. It's too cold, teacher, Rye said when they were in the schoolyard and given proof of her assertion by a little shiver. Mabel did the same, and the three younger children, after a time of watching their elders, went through the same movements. We'd catch our death the cold of sitting on them cold rocks. Mabel said with another shiver, longer and harder than the last one. Maybe get typhoid, Lander said. See, there ain't no sun, Rye said. It's a coming over the ridge, Lander said, pointing to the hill back of the schoolhouse where the pines glowed red in the sunrise. We'll freeze for it hits this place. Let's catch it on the ridge, Rye suggested. But we're supposed to be having school, Louisa pointed out. We can have school on the rocks up there. It'll warm us a walking, and we can gather fat pine and chestnuts on the way, Rye insisted, walking up the hill a little way. Louisa agreed with no more said. She had learned that Rye was usually right. There was no denying that she and Mabel knew more about methods of procedure for the teacher of a one-room school than teacher would ever know. Though far from sorry that she had come, she was walking up the ridge because of no will on her of her own. If they had, upon seeing that the stove was down, wanted immediately to go home again, she could not have prevented their going, just as she could not prevent their coming late to school or leaving early. She could control them while in the building, but outside she could do nothing except through her own power as an individual to cause other individuals to obey. If at noon they wished to stray two miles away for chestnuts, she did not bother, but obligingly went along to help in the gathering. She knew enough of their background to know that they would go anyway. More significant, once having gone without her consent, they would get back in reasonable time for books and suffer no twinge of guilt should she admonish them. School for them and for their elders took place exclusively in the four walls of the small house. School playground was an elastic term, embracing as it did half the lower end of the valley and the slopes of the hills on all sides. It ended abruptly at the coal house. There began the other end. The top of the ridge was reached, and there the sun was warm on the brown sand rocks and fallen leaves. The children laid down their flour sacks containing apples and tablets and sat to rest a spell. Louisa sat with them and looked about her. Behind her was Cumberland, not visible itself, but the steep bluffs of its farther walls raised themselves in a long curve of gray between two hills. She was not interested in what she could see of the river and arose and walked to the top of a high rock not far away. Cow Valley spread the narrow twist of its way before her. She could not see the church or school, but at one end was a cornfield which she recognized as belonging to Lee Buck. Her eyes traveled up the valley, found the road, and two log houses by it that she had not seen before. She called to Rye. The other children came, making a little company anxious to be of use to teach her. They laughed and frolicked and said senseless things after the fashion of other children as they came through the pine needles to the high rock where she stood. But once on the rock and seeing the houses, teacher saw a hard silence fell upon them, so that even to round little quiet they were no longer children, but people with hatred in their eyes and hard words behind their lips. She saw that she had made a mistake in calling them there, but now that they had come, she must say something. Who lives there, she said, and pointed to the houses. The Barnetts. Rye said, in her voice grown suddenly old with a something less bright and more enduring than the passionate hatred of a child. Oh, Louisa said, and thought of the gray-eyed man who had played the fiddle and then run away. 
he might live in one of those houses as they were so near and Lee Buck hated the way his children hated, only he was a man and his hatred stronger. The children had forgotten her. They were silent for a moment, looking at the houses below them with eyes too old for their years. I was there once, right yander, Rye said softly and pointed. When, Lander whispered. When I was maybe six a going on seven, a year I reckon for the last trouble. There'll be more, Lander said. That fiddle, some day I'll go to that place too. I'll ride old Kate and I'll take me Chris's big Smith Wesson. I'll be with you, Pete said. I'll take Pop's little colt and the big Winchester he keeps in the cave. Maybe Chris had come with us, if he's not dead, Pete said. The children were silent again, their eyes not leaving the houses. Rye stood a while, then walked to the edge of the high rock and slowly and with infinite contempt spat toward the houses. Lander looked among the stones about him, selected the largest he could handle, and heaved it with no word said over the hill toward the houses. Pete and Rice did the same. Little Quiet went hunting for pebbles small enough for her to throw, and Louisa could not stand and watch the children any longer. Below her, in a black gum tree, she saw the purple shine of the sour fox grapes that the children had taught her were good to eat after frost. She would gather grapes. The other day, Corey had said that she wanted some for jelly. She hurried to the tree, but the grapes were too high for her to reach. She pulled on the vine, and a few shattered to the ground. She bent to pick them up and heard footsteps over the leaves. She turned, and Mabel was there, looking at her, her dark eyes big and strained with fright. I wished you'd make them stop, teacher, she said. Them Barnett's is so close. I didn't know... She broke into choking, tearing sobs then and clung to Louisa. Teacher smoothed the tight black braids that quivered against her shoulder and tried to think of words for comfort. Uh, nothing has happened in a long time, and maybe... The girl raised her head and looked at her. Something's bound to happen. I heard Mom and Pop a-talking the other night. They heard about the fiddle. She buried her face on Teacher's shoulder again. Mom cried, she said, and Louisa felt the thin body tremble against her own. I heard her. Mom cried. She repeated breathless from her efforts not to sob aloud. She said if and what yuns heard was a haint, it was bad, and if it wasn't a haint, it was something worse, and she cried. She sobbed again, and teacher felt tears hot on her shoulder. I, I'm sure it was a ghost, she said, and knew that her voice carried no conviction. She stood and stared at the red black gum leaves by her feet and wished for Chris and thought that the man who had played the fiddle ought to be satisfied. He had scared the children and made the women cry. Maybe that was all he planned to do. Maybe he had not thought of Chris at all. Rye and the other children came while Mabel still sobbed against teacher, and Rye clicked her tongue and said, Quit your winning, Mabel. It's like Pop says, folks was born for trouble and fun, and they's no use to let neither one get you down. Lander scowled at his sister's back. She always was a crybaby. If and you don't stop now, quiet, she'll be a bawling too, won't you, quiet? I'm going to cry, quiet said and Mabel heard and pulled her face away from teacher's shoulder and wiped her eyes. When Rye suggested that they all go down to where Wins is making lasses and tell about the stove, Louisa readily agreed. She wanted to be with older people, even though they be the inexplicable parents of still more inexplicable children. She was tired of the perpetual moaning of the jack pines and she was lonesome. The long vistas of uninhabited ridges and hills made her too acutely aware of how far away the world was, her world. So, this was a short chapter, but wow, a really serious one, huh? Different things that jumped out at me. In the very beginning, when she talks about the corn and about fodder, about the children talking about fodder, the excitement of fodder and 
uh, molasses or cane stripping. Those are things that uh, Pap used to tell me about when he was a boy. Those were joyous times of the year when you got to strip fodder or gather fodder, gather shocks of fodder, Pap called it, or especially the sorghum or syrup making process because both of those events usually meant people come to help and when people would come to help you, there would be food, there'd be excitement. So it was kind of a big to do, something to enjoy for sure. I didn't, I've never heard anyone, uh, but I've never really grown sweet potatoes. Maybe one time, maybe one time I grew some, but not on a large scale. So I found it really interesting when she talks about pulling the vines before the fruit, before the sun hit the first big frost so that the frost wouldn't go to the sweet potatoes, go down through the vines. Maybe it would make them bitter. That part was really interesting. Uh, if you're familiar with that, you can share that part. Uh, if you know more about it, share that with us. It's really a striking scene when you think about uh, the kids seeing bar the Barnett houses and some of them began to throw rocks and, and then Mabel getting scared. You know, and teacher just can't bear it. Um, now we know a little bit more though. We still don't know the whole story. Certainly sounds like maybe there's a feud between the two ends of the holler or the valley there, the two ends of the valley. But now that we know that they, that they killed uh, Davy and they took his fiddle, you can kind of see why the kids are so upset and kind of see why they've picked up all that anger from the parents and all that worry and, wh and why they're upset about it. You know, teachers still just can't comprehend all of it. She's never had to deal with anything like that. But this part really makes me, after we found out that Davy had been murdered and that they took his fiddle, you know, it kind of makes you think, well, no wonder that there's this division between them and no wonder the kids are, are mad enough to throw rocks at them. So that part's kind of a uh, teacher, though. She still can't understand that. She still don't get it. Uh, and we don't know the full story, which she doesn't either. But the part about Mabel really tugs at my heart when she's crying to teach her because the part she, that really upset her the most was that her mother cried. Mama cried and Mama cried, she keeps saying. So um, I, I remember as a child, the first time I can, I can really tell you, the first time I ever seen Pap cry big, big hiccup and cries like that and sobs with his, as, at his mother's funeral, at my mamma Marie's funeral. And that was the first time I'd ever seen him cry. And I was upset because uh, she had died because I loved her, so I was crying. But to see Pap like having to be led out of the church, mm, still gets me, still about makes me cry. Anyway, but I remember being shocked by that. And I was in fifth grade, so I was young uh, for sure. But that first time when you really see your parents, uh, you, you under, you, don't, you see the fact that they can't fix it all or they don't know it all. You see kind of that um, to a certain age, you think that the, rise, the sun rises and sets on them and they're all powerful. I guess the first time you see that they're not all powerful, that's really um, a, a, a part that usually will stick with you. And certainly for Mabel, that's the part that scared her most it was not really what they were saying, but it was that her mother cried. Her mother was crying. So that really, really bothered her for sure. Let's see what else. Oh, I love the part about the fat pine. They were gathering fat, fat pine. I have a video about what we call rich pine instead of fat pine. So that's a natural like fire starter. Um, and it's pine and it kind of solidifies into a resin like after a pine tree dies or a branch falls off or something like that and you can find it. It's like uh, nature's own fire starter and it's free for the taking. So when we're out in the woods we look for, it's what we call it, is rich pine. She's calling it fat pine. Some people call it lightered or lighter, um, fat lightered or just lightered. So lots of different names but uh, that's something that we always look for and I've got that video so I'll link to that. And then I also found it interesting that they were burning pine. And so most people today don't burn pine, but reminds me of one time years, long, long time ago, I was writing about cutting firewood on the blind pig and the acorn. And I went to talk to Pap and ask him a bunch of questions. And I said, well, what do you think the best uh, firewood to burn is? Which most people would say oak or uh, locust or something like that. Locust is hard to find today. But anyway, Pap said, well, that really depends on how cold you are, doesn't it? So he made a very good point. Kind of depends on how cold you are. So I, I thought that was interesting that they were um, using pine in the stove. And boy, wouldn't you have liked to have seen that stove fall? That's terrible. But 
uh, we've all, or I certainly have, been in Louise's shoes before when you're kind of mad and frustrated and trying to do something and you end up tearing something up because of your attitude. You need an attitude adjustment. I get like that. I need an attitude adjustment. And I've done that, like jerked on something and then wished I hadn't. Um, so I, I can surely identify with Louise's frustration and then causing a bigger mess than what she had to begin with. Uh, I, it is interesting how the kids, like she's noticed that all of her kids could start a fire within three minutes. So that was just a skill that was learned very early on in those days for children to build fires. Uh, but even today, being able to build a fire is a is a neat skill to have, a good skill to have, especially if you're like us and you have a wood stove. But even just being out and about, the ability to build a fire is, is something that's um, a skill that's worth having. If you've never been able to build a fire, I hope that you can learn that skill too might need it for heat or for just to enjoy sitting around. We like to build a fire and just sit around it and talk and might roast some marshmallows or some weenies, as Granny would say, but mostly just to sit around it together and, and enjoy looking at the fire. So please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you from this chapter of Mountain Path, and I hope that you'll drop back by. we got to find out what happens next with Louisa in Mountain Path.